welcome to the Business Fighter with Henry Penix. Henry has been the CEO, founder, and consultant to hundreds of companies worldwide. He retired a multimillionaire, financially independent at the age of 35. Henry grew up a preacher's son and was thrown in jail three times for various altercations. He knows what it means to come from nothing and have to fight his way to the top. Henry is the business fighter who will teach you strategic skills for winning in business and in life. Don't just spectate, participate. It's time to get in the ring. Hey guys, this is Henry Penix, the business fighter with another podcast. I have been graced with the presence of an individual who knows what he's doing in real estate. Uh, I'll let him tell his own story, but he started out being an architect. He's a licensed architect, and then he became the architect of the deal. He's got some information today that you are going to want to hear. If you've got anything to do with real estate or are looking to do anything new with real estate, you've got to know this guy, believe me. Uh, so anyway, welcome, Jay Matheson. Thanks, Henry. Happy to be here. Glad yeah, yeah. Me. Thank you so much. I, I know yeah. we got to chat just a little bit before, uh, before we came on, and, and you've already impressed the heck out of me, so I know my audience is going to love hearing from you. Um, every, every time I bring on a guest, Jay, I always ask them to drop some golden nuggets, something that my audience can learn from. Uh, in this case, I know it's going to be probably real estate, real estate funding. Uh, I do a lot of real estate. I've done housing additions, Subway, Starbucks, uh, all these things, and I love it. But sometimes the hardest part is to get funding, and you've got an answer for that. Before we get into that, tell me uh, just real quickly how you got interested in architecture, and then how did that lead into actually architecting deals? Sure. You know, uh, how I got into architecture is bizarre in and of itself. Um, I, uh, I basically followed my best friend from high school to college because he was going to be an architect. And so I decided, well, that's what I'm going to do then. Right. Um, uh, strangely enough. Now, aside from that, while I was in high school, I had a mechanical drafting class. And my mechanical drafting teacher uh, would give out these drafting assignments and I could whip through them in like 10, 15 minutes when everybody else took the entire class to do it. So he decided that I needed to do something more complicated and had me learn how to draw architectural perspectives. So I got to where that would take me two or three days to do one. And so it slowed me down, I guess. <laughs> you <laughs> were running ahead of the class. class. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, um, so, so I got really good at that and, and I had that skill. And so I knew I could draw and I was like, you know, being an architect, probably is a good deal and I can probably make decent money at it. Right. So I decided my best friend was going to do it. And I thought, well, I'll just follow him and, and go do that. Um, and so that's how I got into architecture. Um, I took a long road through college and architecture and life uh, early on, but ended up getting my license, uh, working in, in architecture for about 10 years, uh, all commercial, I did some residential stuff on the side here and there uh, for my own account. Um, I spent a, an incredible amount of time in, in hospitality, retail, and apartments. And so I know those ends of the business really well, not only from an architectural standpoint, but from an, a financial standpoint and how that all works together. Yeah, and that, that's, what, that's what you're doing now. And that's what I'm really, really interested yeah. in as well. You. An architect's mind has to think a certain way. When you drafted those things faster than anybody else, that tells me that you saw all the pieces of the puzzle, you saw the direction, and you just dug in and did it, and you saw it all. If right. you've been exposed to the financial part of that, where you can not only draw the buildings, but you see the financing, you see the end game of how it was put in, how it was financed, how they get revenues from whatever they put in, and, and the end product, that's what began to interest you, that your architectural mind shifted and you became the architect of the deal. Tell me, tell me how that bridge was built and how you crossed it so successfully. Well, it, it wasn't easy um, because I didn't have any formal training in finance uh, in college. I did take, uh, at my, as my minor, I took business, business classes and mostly business law very little finance, actually. I was very intrigued by business law. I was like, what do people do to make mistakes that screws everything up? 
Right. Um, and, and so taking those classes taught me a lot of lessons in college. I heard a lot of case studies and, and that was interesting. But the way I got into this was um, I was architecting deals and, or, you know, doing architecture. And I noticed that I live in Dallas and I noticed that at the time, this was the early 2000s, that uh, there was a company that started building townhomes uh, in Uptown, just north of downtown Dallas. And they were building these things left and right. And I was like, you know, those things can't cost that much and they're not really that complicated. Why can't I do that myself? Mm -hmm. And so I went out and for probably six months, I started mocking up projects on blank pieces of land around the area and, and started figuring out what the real numbers were. And, you know, after doing it for about six months on end on the side every night during the weekends, Right. I, I started talking to some friends of mine. They were like, what are you doing? And I started explaining. They're like, well, where are you going to get the money? I said, I don't know. And, and next thing you know, somebody comes along and says, well, I'll put in money on it. It makes sense to me. And, wow. and so off we went and we, we did that for a while. Um, and that's how I really kind of graduated into it on a small scale building townhomes. Those yeah. townhomes would sell for anywhere from, you know, 275,000 up to probably 400,000 a piece. Um, and we did that all the way into the crash of 2008. And then, you know, we kind of, I decided at that time, I didn't want to own any more for sale product ever again. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we got through it okay and we came out of it fine. But I realized the value of cash flowing assets like, like apartments, like retail. Uh, and those things and decided I was going to place my focus more in that direction, you know, as time goes on and, and I, as I uh, get older. So that's nice. That's kind of my direction eventually over time. That, now, that then how, did, how did you go from there to uh, we were talking before and, and I don't know if this is public information yet. So I'll let you release it. Well, as you want to, but how did you go from that to, because you ask yourself, all these people have all these great deals, but sometimes financing is very difficult and you're trying to solve that problem as well. Tell me as much as you can about yeah. that. Yeah. So, you know, we're, so as I was going through these development deals, you know, we we're always looking for new deals because if, you know, you're only as good as your last deal and, yep. and you're only, uh, you're only going to stay afloat if you've always got deals in the pipeline and you need to have quite a few in the pipeline because, some might make, some might not make, you know, yeah. whatever. I've had deals blow up and we lost our investor at the 11th hour. Right. That, and it totally tanked the deal and it, and it was costly. Um, I've had all kinds of things happen to us over the years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got to have deals in place and then you've got to have investors or you need to locate investors. And what I found was over time, I was spending more time looking for investors, dealing with banks than I was getting anything else done. Yep. Um, it drains all of your energy, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> I mean, I could figure out a deal for us you know, on paper with a plot of land, you know, in a day or two. Right. And then I spend a, you know, months dealing with, you know, how are we going to finance it? Who's, you know, where are we getting the equity yep. from? And so that all led me to the culmination of I've been doing this so long, I kind of know everywhere you can go. Um, and so we started a finance company and started, started helping other developers, uh, get financing when they needed it. Nice. So, so, you know, we worked out some very good, uh, connections for us, um, in the company and we're continuing to grow those, those relationships on a daily basis. So G give me uh, some guidelines of what you like to look at, because when people hear that you're financing deals, you've got a guy who creates port john outhouses and you've got a guy who creates Taj Mahal's. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so, well, anywhere, so anywhere in between, give me, give me your perfect uh, format. Your, your, per what, what deals you really love to work with and that you would like to get involved with? Well, the deals we focus on mostly are multifamily, uh, some hospitality depends on what it is. And um, we've been focusing on mixed use a lot lately. And the reason for that is we've kind of put a, we, we usually look at deals 50 million and up. Mm -hmm. We don't even look at the bottom, you know, from zero to 50. 
Mm -hmm. um, we will look at some deals that are a little below that threshold, but that's simply because um, they're attractive to us for some reason or another. There's a way we think we can, we can uh, get the deal done. The okay. second thing we look for is borrowers who have equity to get the deal done. If, if they don't have equity and they're, they're trying, you know, to rub two sticks together to make a fire, yeah. you know, we're probably not going to be the right people to work with because that just, that, that doesn't, you'll spend an incredible amount of time and get nowhere. You've got to have equity partners. Um, and, and we don't source equity partners typically. So, um, right. all we do is, is source debt in various forms. Right. So, right. so that's what we focus on. Okay. Most. And, and we do not, and, and we don't deal with acquisition financing either. There's plenty of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac guys out there that you can go to to get that kind of financing. We focus on basically new construction deals, uh, some value add deals, uh, if, depending on what they are and if they make sense. And that's, that's how we focus on this stuff. So if somebody has a, a new construction, either multifamily apartment building or maybe a mixed use, meaning some of these retail spaces where you've got some retail on the bottom, apartments up top, nice little village type community and and they've got some equity in it meaning they either own the land outright or they've got some cash to put in it as well is that the type of person that should contact yeah. you? that's generally what we're looking for um because you know we have various ways we can finance things but if they don't have the top 20 percent or so to put in uh you know actually right now it's probably closer to 35 percent they're gonna have to come up with right. um, but there are ways we can help them move up in the stack a little bit and have a little less equity in the game. Uh, but you know, that's getting challenging at the moment. Um, sure. and I, and then maybe it'll loosen up in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months, but, but those are things we can do for sure. Excellent. Excellent. And if people want to hear more about you or get in touch with you and they've, you've struck a chord with them and, and they want to maybe talk about a future partnership or something. How do they get a hold of you? So they can, they can go to our website, which is Tribeca capital group.com. Okay. Um, and that's try. It's like trifecta, but it's uh, with a V instead of an F. Um, so T R I B E C T A. Mm -hmm. okay. That's correct. And, and they can reach us from there and, and we can continue on from there. If, okay. they want, if they want to talk to us about an opportunity that they're looking to finance. We'll see if it's something that's a fit for us. Okay. Okay. Excellent. And just, just to kind of wind this uh, episode up, this time has gone by very, very quickly. Wow. Uh, well, I know, isn't it? Uh, what do you, what advice would you give someone if they're trying to uh, invest in something, build something, and they're, they're trying to do the first one on their own? Can you give them just like, you know, be, be concerned with one, well, two and three things and, and you're going to have more success. Like what could you, what could you drop for somebody right now with all your years of experience? Well, I would say, um, I mean, that kind of speaks to me because I have always been, I'm going to do it on my own kind of guy, right. but I can tell you when you're dealing with real estate, especially if you've never done it before, you probably would be better served to get somebody on a, partner up with somebody that can show you the ropes, let you look over their shoulder and help you through the process so that you don't stub your toe and lose hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands, millions, whatever. Right. Um, I don't want to lose a dollar. <laughs> right. Nobody, nobody wants to do that. Everybody's worked hard for their money. And, yep. and you know, we all want to try to preserve our principal when we make these investments. So if, if you've never done a deal before, um, that would be my suggestion. Learn from someone before you go jump in on your own. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying you can't do it on your own, but you run the risk of being met with challenges that you can't overcome because you don't have the capital to overcome it later. Right, um, right. Yeah, what you lack in knowledge, you could make up in capital, but if you don't have the capital, you better darn sure have the right knowledge. And that could be with connecting with somebody like you. That could be with getting a mentor that's in the same space you want to get into. Uh, I built a, a chain of schools and we had about 300 employees. We actually ran the schools and built the buildings and did all that. 
And, uh, you know, along with other things that I've told you, Subway, Starbucks, uh, mm -hmm. housing additions, all this stuff. I love real estate, love development. But, but when I started with that first school, I had to go to a guy who knew what he was doing. And, and unless I would have learned some of the things that he knew, you know, fortunately, he was happy to share some of that stuff with me. But I couldn't have overcome a capital loss at that time. Like I had to have the knowledge, the knowledge and it had to be the right knowledge. So right. get somebody that you trust, get somebody who's been successful in what you want to do. And, and, you know, if you just go ask somebody, like a lot of people tell me, Henry, I could never approach these guys. I could never just go ask them for information. Well, you're never going to get it then. You know, if you don't ask, you're not going to receive. Right. And, you know, guys like you who've done a lot of big deals, I've done a lot of deals. I'll, I'll take 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes to have a conversation with somebody. If that helps them, because we've all been helped on some level in our life and we all want to give back like that helps me that helps my right. uh, psychology during the day and all of that so don't be afraid of doing that get a hold of someone call someone go to Jay's website go to my you know wh whoever you can get a hold of ask them those questions but go in prepared is what you're saying uh, yes absolutely know know your deal for sure mm. You're not going to look, you're, you're going to look about as dumb as you can look if you really don't know the numbers on your deal and you're out trying to sell someone on being involved in it uh, from a financial perspective. Right. That is, they're gonna that's that's it a out huge in a mistake you can make. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's one thing to talk about a deal and say, oh, we're going to make a lot of money. But until you can prove that on paper, um, no one who's been in this business very long is going to take you seriously. Yeah. Um, and they may consider you a risk because you you really haven't done the homework to know what you're getting into. So I would I would think about those things for sure. That's great advice. Great advice. Yeah, because if you come out, you know, you may have a great idea and say we're going to make all this money, but the second they smell that you haven't done your homework, then they're like I do. If somebody comes to me like that, I question everything they've told me. Right. You know, like if you're going to yeah, you're going to never end at that point. Well, exactly. Yeah. If you're going to take the most important thing you brought to me and approach it half baked and you don't know all the information, then I've got to discount everything you've just said. I've got to have proof now. I've got to, you know, I've got to go down the checklist. So Yeah. I, you know, I, I, it's funny you mentioned that I, I get guys that call and they're like, we're going to make 30% on this deal. Well, what's 30%, you know, 30% of what? Um, yeah. And, right. you know, when you really get down to doing the math and running the performance and adding in all the costs that they should have figured out they needed to have, uh -huh. you know, they figure out that it's only worth 15%, um, you know, and, and nothing makes them look dumber than, than saying things like that. So, and not knowing um, the facts. Yeah. That to me, at least they look dumb to me. And <laughs> then I start to wonder, well, how do I know you could even handle this? You know, how do right. I know you'd be paying attention to it the whole way through? Um, right. So, those no, that, that's, that's absolutely right. And, and then to, to, to think about the tax ramifications, which can either help or hurt a deal. Uh, we were talking earlier about conservation easements, how they would play into a deal. You've got different tax strategies. You've got gains, losses. You've got, uh, you know, how long you've held a piece of property. Right. You've got, uh, you know, uh, different depreciation schedules, Indian land tax depreciations. You've got uh, opportunity zones you can build in, like all these things matter and they all move that scale up or down certain percentages and know your stuff, right? All right. All right. Absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. cool. Well, look, it, it's been so fun having you on here. I, uh, we may have to do a second one because I've sure. got a thousand more things that I want to say, okay. uh, but, but thank you so much. Thank you for taking out uh, your busy schedule and getting on this, uh, this zoom, uh, meeting. I, I so appreciate it. And uh, I'll, I'll certainly be uh, in touch with you. Okay. Thanks for having us. And I hope everybody stays safe in this strange time we're going through. Yes. Yes. Me too. Okay. Have a great day. Right. Thank you. Okay.